Yesterday in, in session two, we examined the multiple causes of political violence and, and conflict. And you know, we heard that there are several triggers out there. And some important triggers or, or drivers of violence uh, are poor governance, social exclusion, and the weak rule of law. Our panelists, they showed how you know, exclusion from access to power, exclusion from opportunity, from services. You know, all of this creates fertile ground for mobilizing group grievances, you know, into violence, particularly in fragile states or states that are known for human rights abuses. We also talked about, you know, external triggers, uh, which are also uh, uh, important. And we ended up with, you know, I think agreeing that Africa's future could continue to show increased conflict if changes do not occur in governance, in rule of law, in public management of resources, in the inclusion of youth, the inclusion of women, the inclusion of marginalized groups in governance and politics. In this session, we will zero in on violent extremism, particularly violent extremism dynamics. As we all know, violent extremism continues to be one of the most significant challenges to peace and security on the continent. The Qaeda linked groups, so called Islamic State affiliates, and other violent extremist groups, they continue to attract recruits and financing, shrewdly exploiting opportunities that are created by state fragility, by exclusionary governance, by corruption, and by local conflicts. So from the Sahel and the late Chad Basin to East and Southeast Africa, violent extremist groups, they have infiltrated existing local conflicts, and they have aligned themselves with local causes. As these groups establish new footholds and they seek to expand their reach, it's critical that we assess the factors that shape their behavior, the factors that shape their strategies. The good news is that there have been great advances producing more contextualized research, producing more evidence-based knowledge that help illuminate the relevant drivers and conflict dynamics that enable the violent extremist groups to flourish in the affected African states. So the objectives of this session is to examine the nature and scope of terrorism and violent extremism in the continent, to impact the most determining factors that account for the endurance and national and regional uh, approaches to countering violent extremism, and then to examine the role of strategic leadership and other security sector leaders like yourselves here, you know, to countering violent extremism. And to this end, we have, uh, we're privileged to have two distinguished panelists who have done really substantial and substantive work to advance exactly what we're talking about in these two weeks, this evidence based knowledge on the dynamics of violent extremism. So it's my uh, privilege and, and honor to meet and my friend again and to present to you uh, Ms. Angela Martin. She's the senior counterterrorism advisor at USAID's Africa Bureau. She brings 30 years of experience, 30 years of experience designing, managing, and implementing uh, programs with the U.S. government agencies such as USAID, African Development Foundation, and the Peace Corps with significant field experience in West, Central, and Southern Africa and the Balkan. And she's a senior manager and policy advisor with extensive experience in developing and applying policy decisions to assure the successful implementation of field-level projects. And, and I'll just stop here because the, the, it's a long bio. 
uh, out there, but that speaks again to that substantial and substantive experience that, that, that my friend Angela uh, 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 brings here. Um, and then I have my, uh, my dear friend uh, <laughs> and, and really one of the smartest uh, uh, experts in, in the field of, of violent extremism and, and, and terrorism. Uh, Mr. Uh, Idris Lalali, I was with him last week in, in, in Dakar. Uh, so Idris is, is joining us virtually uh, from, uh, from, from, from Algiers. He's, he's the acting director of the African Center for the Study and Research of Terrorism, ASERT or CAIRT, and he's a member of multidisciplinary team designated by the African Union to launch the, the center. And among his primary responsibilities are, at CAIRT are leading the design and development of the center, counterterrorism early warning system, managing a team of analysts that conduct policy analysis, studies, you know, synthesis and audits on terrorism and uh, in, in, in Africa. Uh, and again, it's a privilege to have, uh, to, have, to have Idris here. I have benefited a lot uh, from, his, uh, from his extensive uh, uh, knowledge and, and experience. And, and also I'm proud just to call him a friend. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with you, Angela. Uh, you know, if you can just you know, walk us through what first, what do we know about the trends and drivers, you know, violent extremism in, in the continent? And if you can talk a bit about the most determining factors that account for the endurance and proliferation of these VEOs, violent extremist organizations, if you can provide examples, that would be great. And then if you can end up with the implications of the growth and expansion of violent extremism for African security, and what should, in your uh, opinion, based on your experience, should security sector leaders do now in terms of leadership policies and institutions to address, obviously, this problem that it's only getting, getting worse. So we will have 15 to 20 minutes. All right, thank you. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And again, I'd like to apologize for the delay. Um, one of the things I was gonna touch on at the end of my uh, talk is about the, the idea of interagency collaboration in response to this. And as you can see, we have a demonstration that even in the US, we have our challenges. My badge doesn't work here, even though I have a clearance and all the things. And it used to, because I've actually worked here before, but things changed. Anyway, so I am so delighted to be back here for this seminar and to be in person. Um, I have a long relationship with ACSS. It started back in 2006 at the very first CBE workshop that was held in Algiers. And over the years, I've had the good fortune to participate in numerous seminars, and I continue to be impressed with the knowledge and enthusiasm of my African security professionals that I've met with and collaborated with over the years. I would also like to thank the organizers of this seminar. I do know, actually, the hard work that went on behind the scenes to ensure the success of this event. And the other thing that I do know is the approach that the ACSS has to African-led peer-to-peer learning has been the heart of everything they've been doing. And I really do think it's, it's one of their greatest contributions to this field. Um, so I'm gonna start off by noting that my remarks are my own. I do not represent the views or policies of USAID. Uh, and my own work, as I noted on CTCV, began in, way back in 2005. Probably some of you were still in school or whatever university at that time, if not most of you. Uh, and um, I worked in the regional mission that was based in, that's based in Accra. Uh, for West Africa, where I designed and piloted the very first USAID programs uh, countering violent extremism, and they were part of implementation of what was called the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, which is still around. Since then, I've continued supporting the programming and building the cadre of practitioners throughout the continent. And over the years, I've seen the nature and scale of the threat, as well as our understanding evolve. So the first thing I'm going to do is do a quick, very quick run through the timeline of the major extremist groups to look at this evolution. So going back to when I started way back in 2005, the major terrorist groups had emerged from local conflicts. So there was a GSPC in Algeria and the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda. Yes, the Lord's Resistance Army was designated a terrorist organization by the US after 9-11. As was consistent with their origin, both groups were not formally aligned with any transnational movements. And in fact, our preoccupation at that time, as far as our interest in security in, uh, on the continent was more about uh, uh, conventional wars. There were several countries such as the DRC and Liberia that um, were emerging from conflict. 
as well as there was the ongoing conflict in South Sudan. So the point being is terrorism was sort of on our radar, but not really. In 2007 and 2008, there was a major change with the emergence of al-Shabaab in the East and the rebranding of GSPC as al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and the Sahel. The tempo and scale of attacks increased and foreign targets also became more important, such as UN buildings and personnel in Somalia, or the kidnapping of the US special, uh, the, the special envoy in Niger, the UN special envoy in Niger. Now, how much of this change was driven by this relationship with AQ? Was it you know, guidance or whatever? Uh, and how much was response to military tactics on the ground in response to these new groups is sort of difficult to determine. But certainly some of the instances, the, the increased attacks were in response to, to successes or to their losses on the military field. In 2009 to 2011, we saw the start of terrorist attacks by Boko Haram. They already existed, but they, did, they didn't undertake violence in that style. Um, and the first attacks outside of Somalia by al-Shabaab uh, in Uganda, if you remember the 2010 bombing after the World Cup, uh, during the World Cup, and AQIM expanded where there was attacks in Mauritania, Mali, and Niger, and there was an, a lot of kidnapping for ransom, with uh, Westerners, again, increasingly become sources of revenue. This is also a time when AQIM was actively integrating itself into local clans in Mali through intermarriage and financial support. Then the next, the next phase, 2011 to 2015, saw rapid expansions of all three groups with major attacks in Somalia and Kenya by al-Shabaab, the first Boko Haram attacks in Niger, Cameroon, and Chad, uh, along with significant increases in attacks in Nigeria and AQIM seizing large swaths of Mali before being pushed back. The impact of the Arab Spring was also felt with the flow of militants and guns from Libya into the Sahel. In the Maghreb, we were, everyone was concerned with the stream of foreign fighters to Syria and Iraq, which was another major phenomenon at this time. And the concerns were also not only their contribution to the fight in those countries, but what happened when they returned. Uh, Islamic State became an influence in Boko Haram, pledging allegiance and starting to be referred to uh, uh, ISIS in West Africa, I believe, and, uh, um, at that time. Then we go on. So again, this started a steady stream of engagements and, and, and connections. 2016 to 21 was, was characterized by increasingly complexity in the Sahel. Uh, significant expansion of the scope and scale of attacks, especially in Burkina Faso and Mali, including attacks on hotels and capital cities of both countries. The complexity included entire rebel factions, not just individuals, joining with AQIM in Mali, and also the creation of new um, umbrella clinicians, just as JM, and the emergence of ISIS Greater Sahara. In Nigeria, Boko Haram soon splintered into completing factions, and this also saw the emergence of new terrorist groups. ISIS Mozambique, called at the end, in northern Mozambique, and the rebranding of ADF in eastern DRC as ISIS Central African Province. So, so what does this very, very brief summary of the timeline tell us about current trends? And so I'm going to focus more, I'm sorry for our colleagues from uh, the Maghreb, on Sub-Saharan Africa, just because I have more familiarity of, with those groups. The obvious one has been continued expansion. Although I would say this is not entirely consistent across the continent. Al-Shabaab, while it has maintained its, its uh, strength, has retrenched a bit and is largely focused on gaining and holding ter territory in Somalia. And I would say despite the recent uptick in Cameroon, uh, Iswa Boko Haram has been more active in Nigeria itself. In both instances, the security responses in these VO, to these VOs in neighboring countries has been, I would say, a major factor in, in sort of more of at least a little bit of containment. The emergence of ISIS branches in eastern DRC and Mozambique is more troubling, although, again, the branch in eastern DRC is one of many armed groups committing atrocities and attacking government forces. The implications outside of DRC, or frankly, outside of that region of DRC, uh, is not clear. And while Uganda currently is actively fighting uh, uh, ISIS, Central African province, in collaboration with the DRC, perhaps the resurgence of a conventional militia of M, uh, M23 can have more implications of stability in the Great Lakes region. In the Sahel, the possible expansion southward uh, to coastal West Africa, of course, is one of the greatest concerns. Uh, this has been most evident in the border areas of, Co of Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, and then most recently Togo. However, one could argue the intensity and number of attacks both within Mali and Burkina Faso and in the west of Niger is perhaps even more concerning. Their merging with local groups means that terrorist organizations are more entrenched, 
holding territory and drawing from the local population. This has also seen a shocking, shocking incidence of ethnic conflicts sparked in areas where terrorist groups are operating. The political impact also needs no elaboration with the recent changes of government in Mali and Burkina Faso, prompted at least l largely by the inability to contain a terrorist threat. At least that was the, the primary rationale. A a nev another evolution in the Sahel is what has been termed the jihadization of banditry. As, and that was coined, I believe, by um, colleagues that uh, do the Global Terrorism Index. As criminal groups look to use religion to defend their criminal actions. Now, the, the, there has long been a pragmatic relationship between criminal elements and terrorist groups. And, uh, but this is seen more as a security and perhaps resource, resource sharing administrative type of relationship rather than one based on ideology. Um, but this justification of criminal activity by ideology and allegiance of criminal gangs with ISGS is a new level of integration. And so one final aspect to consider is the relation to, how does the relationship of these groups to the core AQRIS affect the actions of the groups in Africa? And by extension, we can also look at the relationships between groups as well. Again, this differs considerably and has evolved over time. Going back to the initial phase in 2007 and 2008, branding and being accepted by AQRIS gave status, motivation, and perhaps tactical support uh, to operate at a level um, not seen before by AQIM and Al-Shabaab to be part, considered part of the global, uh, uh, global movement. This could have been an increase in suicide attacks or more attacks on Western targets in, these re in, in their respective regions. It also might have been the use of more sophisticated tactics such as IEDs or perhaps help with their online messaging and videos. Um, Later, as AQ and ISIS had losses in the battlefield in Iraq and Syria, attacks by Western-based groups were used by AQ and IS Corps to demonstrate continued relevance, relevance, right? And while there has been speculation that, particularly for ISIS Corps, that they would consider even greater expansion into the continent as a new growth area, there has not been a lot of evidence to support this. And maybe it's because of the deep links to local insurgencies that virtually all of the violent extremist organizations in Africa have. Um, the relationship between groups like, uh, is, is a, is, has always been a bit more nebulous. And um, you know, one can say within the subregion of the Sahel, the allegiances between groups changes frequently, shifts over time, and even the level and depth of collaboration. Between the subregions, so let's say Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram, or Boko Haram and AQIM, it has happened, but it's been more episodic in nature, and the scale and duration does not seem to have made a discernible difference into the groups. So as you can see, the trends are unfortunately more negative than positive. So, so what are the factors for this endurance and proliferation of VEOs on the continent? And I would say while the external ties to AQ and IS have provoked ideological motivation and perhaps an internal spark at different times, one could argue that African VEOs are now indigenous, right? They, they don't really rely on this outside support anymore. And in most cases, these groups started and thrived in what was incorrectly termed back at the beginning, ungoverned spaces. Um, because since in reality, there are certainly some sort of governance structures always present, but you know, Westerners, we like these shorthand terms and it sounds kind of interesting and whatever. Um, However, the, the, so, so however, these two areas often have in common is a weaker relationship with the central government. And this can be due to remote locations and sparse populations like the northern regions of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Mozambique. It could be in dense urban areas with minority populations where the relationship with state security service is contentious. So there are often no goes at dark, at dusk. And it could be areas where the economic importance to the nation as a whole is not really that great. So they're just sort of overshadowed by more strategic regions. So the end result of this weaker relationship supports an environment where terrorism, the terrain is conductive to illicit activity, including terrorist groups. Corruption erodes both um, access to any service provision, but it also distorts and in impedes access to justice. This difficult operating environment and lack of interest in the area by the powerful members of government in the, in the central government make the location undesirable for assignments. In most cases, it can be challenging to find qualified individuals, even if they're from the region um, and that perhaps that particular ethnic group, they don't want to stay. They want to go back where they want to go where there's power and resources, 
or they want to return to an area that's perceived as career limiting assignments. In short, a term used uh, in America, it's a backwater. <laughs> so this makes it difficult. It makes it difficult to turn things around, even when the government wants to change the dynamic and bring the region up to a level that's commensurate with other parts of the country. It took a long time for this environment to be created and the time to build trust, identify local intermediaries and do actions at a scale to make a difference is very challenging. Moving beyond uh, the underlying factors, what about the efforts by security forces? You know, again, I've been doing this since 2005. The investment by Western allies and the African forces themselves has been substantial. And yet, in many cases, initial successes may only transfer the VEO activity to another region or the gains are not maintained. How security services are resourced is one factor. The military is only one component of security with the police and judiciary equally important to sustain any gains. Balancing support and resources across the different agencies has always been the goal on paper. But our own bureaucracies make this challenge to do. You know, money comes from different places, it's different flavors. And my own experience with, with our government is that resources and attention are more focused on the mill to mill support with civilian security and the judiciary lagging behind. And I'm not even talking about my own agency of development. <laughs> so, and again, this is not a new issue. You know, and over the years, I would say the most vocal advocates for um, non military assistance to counterterrorism were my counterparts in the military they all understood the need for this balanced approach. Um, um, but again, the secure, it's a security problem that we're talking about. And so the tendency is to always prioritize a security response. Another challenge has been the transition from an interventionist hot environment to a stabilization or prevention. Even the early strategies to counter terrorism clearly envisioned an end state where military intervention against terrorists transitioned to one led by civilian security. In those visions, a potential terrorist would be, at, would be apprehended as a criminal and would be tried in a court of law. In other words, moving from a battlefield to a normally, uh, uh, normally governed state under rule of law. This transition from uh, one state of operation to the other with the military and lead to civilian authorities and civilian security services is a challenging one even when you're dealing with conventional warfare. In the case of uh, dealing with violent extremist organizations, there are additional risks from legal prohibitions to support reintegration of ex-VEO members to the sensitivity of prosecuting individuals who are espousing religious justification for their actions. All of this is with the backdrop where the conflict hasn't had a clean ending, just morphed or moved into something different. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention external or global factors that have exacerbated the challenges, including climate change, COVID, and the latest macroeconomic impacts of the Ukrainian war. The factors themselves are not perpetuating the presence of VEOs in Africa, but they are an additional strain on local populations and governments alike, from disruption to agricultural and pastoral livelihoods due to climate changing climate patterns, to educational, economic, and social impacts of extended COVID lockdowns, to the, already, to the impacts on already hampered supply chains by the war in Ukraine. The VEO groups are not immune to these same global factors, but a mercenary group operates outside of social norms and structures and is not dependent on systems underpinning a functioning society. So right now you're probably wondering why someone from a development agency has spent all this time discussing terrorist organizations and security. <laughs> well, you know, the first step is always understanding the nature of the threat. This is the starting point for all programs, including those done by the development agencies. And despite the doom and gloom, we do have some lessons learned and there are some options for a response. Um, you know, so the first response, and I think this is touched on as well, um, is, is to have, is to calibrate to the level, the response is calibrated to the level of the threat. And there are now a large number of African led think tanks and organizations throughout the continent that are then analyzing the VE threat within the local context. This is an important resource to help you're all on understanding of the threat. These organizations have a deeper and more substantive engagement on the topic that is not matched by non-African organizations. You know, and again, this is, this is a huge shift. And you know, theoretically, it's one of the things saying, if all of the solutions, if all of the research analysis is done outside of the region, then we're gonna have re responses that are based upon our view and our resources and not the, you know, the indigenous ones. So this is really a key, key change, I think. And, and some of you here 
are in countries that are thankfully not directly impacted by terrorism. You know, so are you operating in a, in a lower minimal threat environment than perhaps planning and capacity building to just understand the basic concepts of CT and CV might be appropriate? Um, you know, I mean, as people from Zambia or Botswana or something like that, you know, what if you're near to a country that has some activity? Okay, one could argue maybe a Tanzania that there's some activity in the country, but it's mostly in border, you know. Uh, you know, maybe there's border security, maybe you do cross regional training, you know, or maybe the intelligence sharing, um, you know, and if you're in a more substantively active environment, well, then I'm hoping that you're already responding based on national and or regional strategies. Um, you know, in all of these situations, one of the things to keep in mind is communication. So in this age of social media, disinformation and distortions are effective tools of DEOs. And this includes um, uh, describing what the government is doing in a way that makes it seem like it's counter to what the actual objectives of the mission is. And so communicating the community by being as transparent as possible to what the government is. Um, and then there's a situation of with youth. While it's true youth are the primary target for many extremist recruiters, I cannot tell you how many times I had elders, local government authorities, and parents in almost every country tell me that the youth these days don't follow traditions, spends too much time on their phone, hang out with friends, and in general are not respectful like they were themselves when they were young. This does not make them at risk for negative behavior. They're not potential terrorists. They're just young. So it's impossible to have a way to empower Euro youth to work with their peers, to, as they're often the better way to reach these youth who may actually truly be at risk. And, at the, and the other thing that I really want to focus on is at the interagency level. As I noted before, all CTCV strategies propose a holistic or whole of government approach. You know, But terrorism is considered a national security problem. So a military or security services, let's say an NCTC in Kenya, is going to be the lead in coordinating. So you have to build partnerships with, if you're in the military, with non-military actors. And if you're outside of the military, you have to educate yourself to be able to communicate with the military. This is not something that's natural for us, right? Um, so, you know, how do you do this? In, in my own government, I was, again, I said it wasn't easy. It was certainly a learning curve. Going back to that first uh, workshop, I, you know, it was a bunch of, frankly, generals and one other USAID person and myself, someone from the FBI. And we were all wondering why we we're in the same room. You know, it, it, was, it was definitely a learning curve. Um, and, you know, and I would say that this type of collaboration is even challenging within security services. You have the military and the police and perhaps, the, you know, the Division of Wildlife or Border Security. And it's hard to have a way to have a, you know, talk together. Um, and then when you add on like the Ministry of Youth or the Ministry of Education, it becomes quite challenging. Like I said, are my own experiences with that. And there's no secret sauce, but having a common vocabulary and understanding can be a start. You know, this is where a shared understanding of the threat, having conversations. And um, the other thing I found is moving collaboration from a general principle. Well, we should collaborate, it's good for us. Um, into identifying a subset of tasks or specific actions working together that provides a discernible benefit, you know. So, so you know, to give you an example, there was something called a security governance initiative. Uh, several years ago. And that was a special program that was focused on often in a being border actions that was a collaboration of USAID, state and aid, but it was a subset of activities. And that actually worked pretty well. It was in Mali, I think it was in Niger, and it was in Kenya and a few other places. You know, the other thing is plan for success. So what are the factors to help you know that you're making progress? What is the end state what are the specific aspects needed to get there? You should be able to describe what you want to get to, even if it's 10 years out. And you know, what is the success? Is it there's no terrorists anymore? That's what we used to say many years ago. Um, or is it just that the instability is, is minimal so it doesn't disrupt daily life? You know, what does it mean? Is it, is it about access to justice and having the structures in place for that so you can prosecute terrorists? Is it conflict mitigation structures, like I mentioned, that promote inter-ethnic exchanges and social cohesion? You want to be as specific as possible about what are, where you're going. It helps you better articulate and track the steps to keep moving forward, even when there are setbacks. 
And believe me, I've had to have these conversations in my, within my own government. And last but not least is you need a sufficient time frame for these positive changes to take hold. Making a case for sustained engagement until you can transition to the steady state of normal government operations is something you should build into the response. And that's challenging again, but again, being able to talk about where you're going, explaining the steps and how you're getting there. And I'm gonna close at the, with that the progress here has been, in, you know, on this top on, with terrorism in Africa has been inconsistent. But I really never question resolve of my African counterparts to respond to this or any other security challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Angela. And this was uh, again it, it it shows the the amount of uh, of experience that that Angela brings to the to the table. Uh, but it was it was it was it was it was critical because as she mentioned earlier, I mean, despite you know substantial international support deployed gradually over the past decade, this has not reversed the course of of, of security. So so we have to identify you know the major shortcomings. We have to assess you know the rationales. Uh, uh, we have to have a plan for 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 success. Otherwise, the practices and and the existing security arrangements, you know, that, that we have are not going to produce, you know, any, uh, any, uh, any, any, any results. So a thorough review is, is needed to identify what, what Angela talked about, you know, the lessons, uh, uh, the lessons uh, learned. Uh, so with that, I'll go to, to you, Idris. Uh, based on, on the analysis that you have heard, you know, of the trends and the drivers of violent extremism in the continent. I mean, what is your assessment of African state responses to the growth and expansion of violent extremism? And what are the challenges, you know, hindering effective response? And if you can provide examples, uh, and, and you are one of those that, that come from the center, that's exactly what Angela was talking about, that produced that indigenous scholarship, you know. Uh, from from the continent. So, what are the concrete and, and practical measures based on on your experience that African you know nations can take, you know, in terms again of leadership, policies, institutions, you know, working at the community, at the national, regional, and international levels to better counter uh, VEOs uh, on the continent, and how can the EU? Obviously, the African Union, the CAIRT, and the RECs make their response, you know, mechanisms uh, as uh, adaptive as as we have heard these violent extremist organizations uh, are. So, uh, so Idris, you have uh, 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. It's good to see you. Um, yes, um, I I go back into the uh, two thousand and five exactly uh, when. Uh, Amanda, uh, you know, attended that meeting, the famous meeting in 2006 in Algiers, where I had the pleasure of meeting Amanda. So this shows that uh, we've been in this uh, for quite some time now. Um, and I'd like to congratulate Amanda for this, um, I would say, overview of the development of the threat of terrorism. And then, uh, you know, uh, sharing also with us some of the challenges that we are uh, or are hindering an effective counterterrorism framework or uh, successes on the ground. So without going back on the development of, of the threat on, uh, in Africa, allow me to spend some time focusing on how uh, the African Union Commission uh, response on CT have also uh, evolved and attempted, uh, attempted to adapt to the changing nature and uh, the expanding magnitude of the threat as uh, was presented by, uh, by um, Angela. Um, but also, uh, you know, share with you some of the challenges uh, hindering effective response, at least or responses, at least from our point of view and how we have experienced it from within the, the continent. Uh, the, the EU's efforts to prevent and combat terrorism uh, have a long history. Uh, as you know, uh, we were among the first to have adopted uh, a convention, and this dates back to prior to 2001, uh, the attack, the, uh, the, the unfortunate attack of 9-11. Uh, the EU had, by then, 1999, had put in place uh, the Counterterrorism Convention on the Prevention and Combating of Terrorism in response to a number of, uh, of events that Amanda made reference to uh, during that uh, 
decade or at least the few years that, uh, that came before 9-11. And then it uh, was substantiated by a plan of action on the prevention and combating of terrorism of 2002 that came to operationalize the convention. And then uh, we uh, went ahead and adopted a protocol to the convention to bring some updates uh, in relation to states' engagements, but also expectations on what they need to do uh, to enhance not only their own capacities, but also to ensure there is greater cooperation and coordination uh, at the continental level. Uh, for that, in that respect, the uh, center, the African Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism was established uh, to have, uh, to play that role of ensuring that member states have the capacity and second, to ensure that member states are co cooperating and coordinating better their actions on, on the ground. Um, these, for those of you that are, um, you know, curious to find out about the EU's efforts, I invite you to, uh, uh, to consult a report. Uh, we call it the Nairobi report. This is the fourth, fourth hand, uh, well, 455 uh, fifth, sorry, Peace and Security Council meeting at the heads of states and government. And it's a good uh, 30 pages document that allows you, you know, to appreciate um, the efforts of the Af African Union uh, throughout the last decade on, on counterterrorism. Uh, the EU focus um, or focus its efforts on capacity building, if improvement of anti-terrorism normative framework, as I uh, present, uh, um, shared with you, and promotion of better institutional interactions and coordination at national and regional levels, and the development of early warning capacity, uh, in theory, that allows for early intervention and action. Uh, as a follow-up, uh, therefore, uh, to existing African Union uh, instruments and many of the decisions that were adopted at the level of heads of states and government, and in response to some of the, these challenges and others encountered in the fight against terrorism, including logistical and financial constraints, the EU has taken additional uh, initiative. These relate to the prohibition of payment of ransom to terrorist group since KFR had become a serious issue and a, uh, and, a, and a good source of financing for terrorism uh, on the African continent. The development of an African anti-terrorism model law, uh, the appointment of an AU special representative for counterterrorism cooperation, uh, collaboration with relevant stakeholders, organization of assessment and evaluation missions of uh, member states' capacity to prevent and combat terrorism, development of an African arrest warrant, and the establishment of uh, of the Peace and Security Council Committee on Counterterrorism, in addition to the establishment of a continental list of terrorist groups and organizations, including a passport watch list of persons, suspects of terrorism, and so on and so forth. So you see that there were many decisions that were taken at the policy level, but also uh, at the operational level uh, to enhance exchange of information, but also to ensure that uh, terrorists or suspected terrorism, terrorists are um, identified and then arrested and brought to justice. And above to the addition mentioned or the uh, to the above mentioned efforts, the Commission has launched initiative targeting specific threats in certain areas or regions of the continent, such as the AMISOM led fusion and liaison units, uh, the Nouakchott and Djibouti processes and the EU led regional cooperation initiative for the elimination of the Lord's Resistance Army that Angela made reference to earlier. Uh, the objective of, of these initiatives is to facilitate the pooling of resources and efforts to enable the countries, or at least the concerned countries, to address common security challenges or common threats of terrorism uh, more effectively. Moreover, uh, CAIRT, or the African Center for the Study of Research on Terrorism and the, and the Commission, have been and continue to be actively involved in capacity building, uh, supporting member states in many areas, in particular in enhancing the judicial and police cooperation. And um, since we realized that we have to respect the rule of law and do due diligence, then there was a need um, you know, to go on the, beyond the military approach and to start integrating a more and more judicial uh, and legal approach into the uh, terrorism uh, uh, landscape or the counterterrorism landscape on the continent, which contributed to the creation and the establishment of the uh, African Union Mechanism for Police Cooperation. So this will be our sister organization, but looking at it from a police point of view, which will certainly enhance the, um, the execution of the African arrest warrant, but also ensuring um, more of a criminal justice response or effective criminal justice response to terrorism. Uh, in, 
as um, you know, uh, as it is quietly, um, you know, uh, and agreed, uh, is that partnership uh, within the continent, within the different organizations that have been created, but also beyond are necessary for an ineffective uh, counterterrorism uh, campaign. And this is why uh, CAIRT or the center that I represent, along with the commission and other specialized institutions, um, s put a, a great emphasis on partnership uh, and ensuring that um, the cooperation that is happening at the level of the terrorist groups that go beyond one uh, continent are also replicated in the actions of counterterrorism and the partnerships that we build. So over the last 20 years, we have built partnerships beyond Africa uh, with the uh, Americas, obviously, uh, the European Union through you know, Europol, but Eurojust also, and then other, um, other continents uh, and, and partners such as those that are uh, in Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on and so forth. So the AU has continuously shown innovation and creativity in its approaches, uh, given the various security challenges it faces as an organization and the multiplicity of threats, uh, you know, threatening the, the continent. In addition to the Africa peace and security architecture, in which the AU highlights and recognizes clearly the importance of the role of regional economic communities and regional mechanisms in implementing the African Union peace and security agendas. The EU has also adopted and is putting emphasis on the African governance infrastructure, uh, sorry, uh, architecture. Uh, and this is we are, uh, why we have witnessed in the past two years a reorganization within the institution itself, whereby we brought peace and security commission and the political affairs commission under the auspices of one commissioner, the Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security. So AGA or the Africa P uh, Governance Architecture is inspired by the Constitutive Act of the African Union that expresses the AU's determination to promote and protect human and people's rights, consolidate democratic institutions and cultures and ensure good governance and the rule of law. Uh, this is quite important because as Angela was presenting earlier, there is a need to go beyond the military approach and to ensure that we are more and more promoting a whole of government, a whole of society approach. Uh, the principal objective of, uh, of, of uh, is in implementation of the EU shared values, and uh, in particular, the Africa Charter on democracy, elections, and governance. So clearly both APSA, uh, the Africa Peace and Security Architecture, and AGA, the Africa governance architecture highlight the need to adopt more comprehensive approaches to counterterrorism and preventing and combating violent extremism. A wider softer approach, uh, uh, soft approach complementary to the military and security actions are essential to sustain global peace. Both, the, uh, both these architectures serve also to sensitize AU member states government on issues of good governance and to blend of uh, a human security with our traditional approach to national security in order to ensure community protection, empowerment, resilience, and accountability. Exactly what Angela was saying in her uh, remarks. The end state would be to win the hearts and minds of local communities and associate them in the decision-making process on issues that impact them and their livelihood directly. So, Chair and Anwar, uh, in terms of challenges, there are a number of challenges, I think, uh, Angela did, uh, did, did justice to some of these challenges. I, uh, I'd like to share with you also some of those that we consider as being very important. Uh, in addition to the structural factors or challenges that need to be addressed, it becomes clear that there are many other factors uh, that render difficulty the effective and efficient prevention and combating of terrorism on the African continent, among which uh, we realize that national strategies sometimes are completely disconnected from the regional security situation or context. So member states have a tendency of developing their counterterrorism strategies, disregarding that they are part of a wider community or a wider, a wider region, which impacts and being impacted by what's happening at the level of the state. Inadequate counterterrorism strategies also, in a sense that they are developed not as on a needs basis, but it is a requirement to receiving funding and support from partners. So countries are developing many of these strategies as cut and paste, but not necessarily strategies that are driven by the need, but also strategies driven from within, out of necessity, uh, that are developed in order to address the root causes of uh, violent extremism or terrorism from within, but also to address some of the security challenges that they are facing. 
So these strategies are not, therefore, not necessarily reflect national capacities, priorities, and specific contexts, negatively impacting ownership, one, and then the implementation itself by uh, the national stakeholders and actors. We have also realized that our multiplicity and redundancy of initiatives, programs, and mechanism, uh, this disregarding strategies. If I, if we look at the Sahel, for instance, uh, on which uh, Angela, you know, uh, uh, presented, I think there are over 18 strategies developed and adopted by a number of international partners, including the member states themselves. So you see that there are redundancies happening here, which sometimes conflict with each other and make it difficult for any co coherent um, uh, approach and coherent implementation of, of uh, uh, and success uh, on the ground. We continue also to apply long-term strategies to urgent and pressing security situations. We have to realize that what we're looking for is not, you know, quick, say, a quick um, uh, as they call them, quick wins. We want to ensure that we put in place programs, but also our approach has to be long-term. If we are speaking on development issues and addressing the root causes of terrorism and violent extremism, we know that this cannot be a one-year cycle uh, uh, activity, uh, but rather it will take quite some time before it's being implemented, but also before we reap the rewards and we are able to assess and evaluate the impact that we are having on the ground. Uh, we have also ill-prepared capacity to react and anticipate on events and their impacts. So early warning, sometimes also investment in early warning is not matched with early response and early action. And we've seen it on more, uh, so many occasions. The indicators are there, we're looking at the problems, but unfortunately either the decision-making process or the capacity to intervene does not, is, is not matched. So it, it, it makes it a bit difficult uh, you know, to address these challenges or the identified challenges, uh, even if we are capable of identifying them quite early in the process. Cap capacity building has focused mainly, if I look at the last 20 years and our, you know, the inv investment that our international partners have put in, has been focused on legal frameworks and judicial capacities of member states. As I told you in the car last week, you know, we focused on once you arrest the individual, bring them through the uh, judicial, uh, and I would say the process whereby they're brought before a judge and put in prison. So this would be the de-radicalization, rehabilitation programs, and then reintegration. But we have not matched it with an investment that allows you to detect the individual, to identify the, the individual, be able to investigate before you arrest. So a lot of investment needs to be then done and made on capacitating the member states through training and also through equipment in, to, in order to identify, apprehend before we can bring the person or the suspected terrorist before justice. And then obviously, as um, Angela presented, we have other security challenges that are impacting the threat of terrorism or the spread of threat of, of terrorism and violent extremism. We initially had the so-called Arab Spring, and then we had these various internal conflicts, political instability, um, and the past three years, at least, or at least 10, 10 years, if you look at Mali, through coup, three coup d'etats, Burkina Faso, two coup d'etats, uh, Guinea-Bissau, the same thing. So we have this issue of unconstitutional changes of government and the various security vacuums that this has created are impacting a great deal the, counter, or the efficiency of any counterterrorism action that we are um, conducting on the ground. We also have this challenge of huge reliance on partner funding, partner support, and partner assistance and increasingly foreign military intervention, whether it is you know, um, uh, national militaries from partners on the continent, or now we're perceiving this issue of PMCs, private military contractors slash mercenaries that are coming into, uh, uh, into the, uh, the equation, all of which have contributed uh, not only to increase foreign interference, but weaken national sovereignty. And I think this has uh, put you know, uh, many of our countries uh, at a disadvantage. Um, and then, you know, uh, as I said, you know, we have this increasing reliance on foreign fighters um, and mercenaries in city operations. And as uh, Angela presented it, this comes with uh, a heavy load in terms of violation of human rights and then uh, this, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the impact that it's having on local populations. And this also is contributing to the state's authority um, to be diluted. Uh, most importantly, it's impacting negatively the trust 
of citizens in their government or state's capacity to protect them. Um, and this becomes very, this is quite important because we're still, uh, you know, promoting and we know that the solution to this effective counterterrorism uh, campaign or at least efforts is that the communities are on your side, but they also have a role to play from within uh, to ensure that the implementation of any action plans on uh, countering or preventing violent extremism are successfully implemented. So without the communities buying an ownership, it becomes then difficult to build and ensure sustainable peace and uh, sustainable development in many of the countries. In terms of, um, I would say the second question I was requested to address practical measures uh, that African nations can take in terms of leadership policies and institutions. I think at the continental level, uh, and this is by definition translated at the national and regional level, uh, the AU has been encouraging and promoting, as I said earlier, a whole of government, a whole of society to the problems of CT, uh, or terrorism and violent extremism, uh, recognizing that uh, countering violent extremist programs necessitate wide ranging engagement with various stakeholders, um, obviously with special focus on socioeconomic problems to reduce the vulnerability uh, to extremist ideology so as to ensure effective implementation and sustainability of related measures. Excuse me. In that respect, gender and age sensitive approaches, for instance, must therefore be mainstreamed into the response. And we've realized that, you know, at least for those countries that, uh, uh, that we were called upon to revise the or review the national strategies, the gender dimension and age dimensions were not really taken into consideration. So the mainstreaming of gender and age issues must be accompanied by specific and urgent action to increase protection, for instance, of women and youth, and to ensure that they are empowered to part participate fully in planning, in the planning and decision-making processes, in all actions for conflict resolution, early recovery and development, as well as all mechanisms for evaluations and enhanced capacity. Therefore, a human security response approach to preventing and countering violent extremism with the citizenry and their, lo uh, and their local communities as the primary reference object uh, of national security policy formulation and implementation are indeed what the EU, um, and in particular the Center, has been promoting. And, and I think we've also been promoting it with the joint activity that we have ongoing with the Africa uh, Center. And I have to salute you for that, for supporting us uh, over the past two years in rolling this uh, discussion also from a policy level all the way to the community level. So uh, this is something that we're keen on continuing. Without uh, you know, the actions of the citizenry, it is agreed that military expenditure and counterterrorism operations, particularly with regard to violent extremism or in violent extremism zones where poverty and marginalizations are per uh, per pervasive, will be a mirage. So we cannot really say that we have uh, you know, successfully combated the threat of terrorism uh, have, <laughs> as long as you know, the, the citizenry is not really taken into consideration, but also the citizenry isn't at the center of the solution and an effective uh, and primary uh, actor. Additionally, greater coordination in relation to information sharing at the level of member states and regions is really needed. You know, we've keep on talking and we see various documents and agreements and decisions on enhancing cooperation, enhancing uh, information sharing, but little is done. Uh, honestly speaking, in that sense. So there is greater need or there is an urgent need to enhance uh, relationship or uh, between member states in order to share information on terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, therefore, we have been very active in promoting uh, two things, promoting the development of regional and counterterrorism fusion centers. So uh, within the nation, you will have all your national stakeholders feeding into a national counterterrorism fusion center that allows greater coordination, uh, information sharing, but also strategic analysis and operational cooperation at the level of the state. This also allows you to create synergies and then have shared responsibility, I would say shared, sorry, not responsibilities, but uh, shared um, resources uh, and, and use these resources much efficiently in order for you to combat within your national countries 
uh, at least the threat from uh, in an effective way. So without national coordination, well, um, I would say a, a rooted national coordination that it becomes difficult to have a well effective regional and I would say even international uh, uh, coordination and uh, cooperation. Uh, in that sense, what we are also working on is the establishment of regional fusion centers, but also regional counterterrorism center. And throughout the continent, we've succeeded in having three regional fusion centers already operational, and then one regional counterterrorism center. The, la the last one was in the Sadak region, uh, where they launched the regional counterterrorism center. Uh, which is housed, um, uh, hosted in, uh, in Tanzania. So although military strategies may be justifiable in combative situations, more practical and elastic solutions must be targeted in preventing measures. So we have to invest more in prevention uh, than uh, you know, the military approach uh, itself. So policies, programs, and initiatives geared towards preventing terrorism and violent extremism must be necessarily considered um, in order to at least address the root causes and the, uh, the, the, the root causes conducive to uh, the emergence and the expansion of, of terrorism. Uh, just to you know, uh, worry of time, um, another issue is the multitude of security arrangements. Let me look at, you know, take the Sahel, for instance, uh, as an example. We have the, uh, the, the G5 Sahel, we have Force Takuba, we have the French Barkhane. Uh, we have the AU who's willing to deploy or thinking about deploying 3,000 troops. We have MINUSMA. So you see there is a, a variety or multitude of security arrangements and forces operating within uh, regions such as the Sahel. So there is a need to set up proper and stronger coordination between the different forces operating in the field and clarity with regard to command and control. And I think this becomes necessary. We should have the humility also of reviewing the financial implications of actual deployments uh, in, a, in, in, in regions such as the Sahel, uh, their efficiency and, and consider building more trust and investing in upgrading local defense and security forces. And I think it's quite important that we spend more in trying to develop the capacities of local security and defense forces. Uh, lastly, we need to build sustainable counterterrorism capacity of the concerned member states. Again, sustainable homegrown counterterrorism measures uh, are the only long-term solution, at least from my point of view, uh, to ensure that um, you know, we have much more sustainability built in to the capacity building that we uh, uh, developed. Internationally, quickly, I, I know uh, maybe I'm over time, uh, after 20 years, since the adoption at least of Resolution 1373 and the dramatic event of uh, 2001, 9-11, uh, um, a lot of capacity or at least a lot of investment uh, have been put in order to ensure uh, the building capacity of, region, of relevant regional organizations, for instance. So I think with 20 years of experience, the AU, uh, SADC, uh, ECOWAS, uh, other regional or sub-regional organizations, I think they have acquired a certain degree of capacity on which partners can rely on. Um, as, as partners, you know, when they're implementing programs, but also uh, to consult with them. I think they are better positioned uh, to articulate, you know, uh, international obligations, norms into more concrete uh, actions locally, one. And second, they are more sensitive to the specificities of the respective regions, but also countries, and they will be able to share uh, with you, you know, what can work, what cannot work. So I think uh, a way forward would be to have greater consultation between the partners that are involved on the continent, uh, a greater coordination of efforts between the partners, again, and regional and sub-regional organizations. So um, we therefore need more innovations and partnership to help prevent the spread of terrorism on the continent. That's quite clear. Uh, using available resources also is quite important to ensure uh, you know, local ownership uh, and local implementation and uh, a local responsibility uh, on security. So to, you know, one last sentence, what I always like to, uh, to end with is that as terrorist group adapts, we must also adapt our tools and actions. So we need to build in some kind of flexibility into our approach um, because, uh, you know, uh, terrorists are highly adaptive and whatever measures we put in place, whatever programs, whatever offensive we put in place, they have this capacity to adapt quite quickly. So we need to embed into whatever solutions we're proposing 
uh, a degree of, uh, of flexibility that allows us to respond promptly and effectively to these thank threats. You, uh, so uh, without uh, going further than this, allow me to stop here and thank you very much for your that, attention. That you and, and Kai are, to, are doing, you know, the creativity and the innovation that, that you have uh, uh, brought, obviously, to, uh, to trying to tackle this, this issue trying to uh, increase capacity building, uh, focus on enhancing the rule of law, integrating the judicial approach, uh, police cooperation, you know, information sharing. Uh, you also talked about the, the, the challenges, uh, you know, in terms of national strategies and, and how some of them are disconnected, you know, they're not attuned uh, to local dynamics, they're not driven by need and, and necessity. Talked about the multiplicity and redundancy of strategies. Uh, as the example you, you cited in, in the Sahel, there is no coherent implementation in that. Uh, you also talked about the various instruments in the so-called civilian crisis management toolbox and how these are struggling to show results in the continent. And one of these is early warning, uh, which faces a double challenge. I mean, there is a, a you know, ubiquity of information there, uh, which requires early warning systems to take a different approach in terms of identifying and analyzing data but also you need willingness and capacity to act on that information, right? To, uh, to prevent uh, crisis. So there's a lack of swift action to respond to, to, to these warnings, which is uh, exacerbated by but what you uh, discuss. And that hampers the work that, that you do, uh, obviously at, 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 at CAIR. Uh, State-led security responses also are, 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 haven't fared much better than, 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 than that. If you look at peace support operations, you know, uh, so uh, the recent failure of, of Barakhan and, 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 and other here, and that rekindled, rekindled the debate about whether a military response is, is, uh, is, is, is the only, you know, was the best way to deal with, with violent, extremist, uh, violent extremism and, and peace, peace building.